Hi everyone, welcome to my sense journey. I hope you're all doing well. Um, glad to see most of you here. Mm -hmm. Today we are privileged to be hosting one of my mentors <laughs> from uh, Pony University. Mm -hmm. This is um, someone who's played the key role in my uh, career in science, and I'm so grateful to have her here today to speak with you guys. Uh, her name is Professor Suhaila Hashim. Um, she is Associate Professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Bi Biotechnology at Pony University, and she's also the current uh, manager of the Pony University Biosciences Research Center, and also the program coordinator for the Master's Bioinformatics program at Pony University, which I think is what most of you are interested in today. Uh, she is also a co-PI uh, for the Eastern African Network of Bioinformatics Training, which supports also the uh, MSc Bioinformatics program at Pony. But I think the funding for this has ended, and now we have uh, the Dad in Country Scholarship Program, which is what we will be talking about today. She is also passionate about research and mentorship, and she's been supporting education programs as a member of the Boards of Management of two high schools in Mombasa. And she also has a vast experience in administration and management, having served as the chair of department for over eight years at Pwani University, and also a two, three year terms as a member of the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute Board of Management. I can go on and on and on about uh, Professor Suhela, but above everything else that she has accomplished, she remains uh, someone who's very humble, uh, you can easily reach out to her about anything, and this is one thing I admire about her. And I hope that, you know, we can get to learn from her story and also become, uh, you know, incredible scientists like, uh, you know, the path that she has set for us. So I'm so happy to have you here, Prof. Um, and, you know, you're just going to start this conversation on sort of like an informal uh, setting. And, you know, just to ask you, I, I like this first part of the <laughs> segment because <laughs> I usually get to know my speakers more than I thought I, I did. So you're going to start with a fun fact. So can you share with us uh, a fun fact about you, something that people don't know? Well, uh, I haven't really thought about that really, but um, mm -hmm. I think people get uh, amused when they hear that uh, I like cycling and that I used to cycle oh, wow. as a student when I was at Lund University. That could be oh, a wow. fact, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I would wonder, you know, this uh, professor with a busy yeah. cycling, you yeah. know, and, and, and honestly, when I went to Lund as a yeah. student, I I was wearing my bubu, yes. Uh, th this is the, the, the hijab for those who don't know the Swahili word, you know, Muslims wear the long robe. Yeah. And I started seeing ladies wearing their winter Sports and cycling. Yeah. So I said, hmm, so it is possible. Then I got myself a bike. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, yeah. I can picture that, but I mean, it makes more sense, you know, in Europe and. In uh, Europe, uh, exactly, like, you're, yeah. You're doing it back at home. <laughs> but I think jogging, you know, wearing cycling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, so it, when I came yeah. back after my, my PhD, I remember telling my professor in, in Chiromo, Professor Mula, I was like, I really miss cycling because I got a house near Chiromo and I was like yeah. if I had my bike I'll just be cycling Chiromo and back and he told me unless you really want to commit suicide please don't get a bicycle <laughs> that's so true that's so true because that is not a risk you want to take in Kenya or in, in an African country but yeah these days I see people actually cycling in Kenya and I'm like oh wow yeah yeah that's good that's good but yeah that's <laughs> That's a good one. So you I probably didn't know about that, did you? <laughs> no, I couldn't picture you cycling. Like, no, not in my world. Well, I'm going to send you a photo. Guess what? I, uh, I went to Copenhagen, yes, okay. uh, this August. We had a yeah. project meeting with the Danish Technical, the, the Technical University of Denmark. Yeah. So I went with my daughter, and she yeah. convinced me to hire bicycles for 24 hours. And we're cycling <laughs> all over Copenhagen city on bikes. So I did it wow. again. Recent as August this year. I'll wow. definitely share some photos. <laughs> I need to see those photos. I need <laughs> I need evidence. Oh yes. Yeah, oh yes. That's really good. 
All right, so you're going to jump in. Um, so we'll start by you sharing, you know, your experience about how you ended up becoming an associate professor in Pwani uh, before we dive in into the bioinformatics program. Program, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I guess people are probably curious about my academic background. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was in Chiromo. Okay, I grew up in Mombasa and all, and then those days there were no universities here. So I'm talking like... I'm quite a dinosaur also, and I'm quite old. <laughs> so anyway, um, so there were no universities at the course. So we all had to come to Nairobi or on the, there were five main universities. So I ended up in Chiromo and I ended up pursuing BSc biochemistry and zoology. At that time, there was no BSc biochem program, standalone like a BSc microbiome. It was just a BSc general, and then you had to choose options. So I was already fascinated with biochem and I chose biochem. And then I continued my MSc in biochem in Chiromo. And then after that is when I went to do my PhD in biotechnology at Lund University. It was through this uh, big program which was funded by CEDA. Uh, it was called uh, BioAN, which was just East African Regional Network for Biotechnology and uh, Biosafety and all that. So we had 20 students from four East African countries who went to, to Sweden. It was like a sandwich program, so I did my PhD there. Then I came back, I worked for one year in Chiromo, and then I went back for my postdoc. Now, after my postdoc for two years, back in the same department at Lund University, that's when I came and joined Pwani University in 2010. It was still a college uh, of uh, Kenyatta University. Then I yeah. grew up the ranks. I, I joined in as a lecturer with a PhD, several publications and all that. So now I started the journey to senior lecturer, then to associate professor. Of course, the requirements we all know you need to publish, you need to teach, you need to Mm. Uh, mentor students, supervise masters, PhDs, and for you to jump to associate, you must have uh, supervised PhDs to completion. That's the, usually the big bottleneck there. And then Pwani being a very young, young institution, we didn't have yeah. uh, PhD programs then, you know, so that was a bit of a challenge for a young university. So yeah. yes, you the rest you have said, I believe, and now I'm managing the Pwani University mm -hmm. Biosciences Research Center. Yeah. Is there a number of students that you need to have supervised, like, uh, for you to become associate professor, like, and you've said you need to have supervised MSc and PhD, is there, like, a number tagged to it? Yes, yes. Now, each university is different. For Pony, mm. I believe it's four, and at least one must be at PhD level. And then to oh, okay. jump to a full professor, you must have supervised at least five. And at, uh, out of the five, two of them must be PhD students. That's why it takes long to move up the ranks. Because by the time you get a PhD student, by the time they finish, both of them, you know, yeah. it takes a few years. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the papers? I think I also, um, you know, you yes. mentioned the papers as well. Is there like a number that you need to have yes. published? Yes. Uh, I don't remember it often, but mm -hmm. to jump from lecturer to senior, you needed like three publications. And I think maybe. Mm -hmm. Senior to associate is probably another three or four, and then I think to 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 full professor, if I'm not mistaken, should be five yeah. at least publications. Yes. And the, all these publications need to be done in like need to be from the university that you're currently lecturing mm -hmm. from, or it could be like publications from your PhD or. Well, the, your publications from your PhD will probably get used up uh, when you jump now from. Um, from lecturer to senior. Although nowadays even lecturer level, because in Kenya, uh, for you to get your PhD, you must have published at least two papers, right? So now the yeah. criteria has changed a bit. So PhD with two publications, you join in at, as grade 12 lecturer. Then from mm -hmm. lecturer to senior, now you need three publications. But those of us, I when see. we joined in from lecturer point, uh, if you didn't use up your publications, like for me, I did my postdoc, so I joined in as a lecturer and then I published from my postdoc work. So I could use those publications now towards my senior lecturer. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, for curiosity purposes, for anyone that is interested in, you know, uh, taking up these positions, uh, yes. you know, back at home. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's jump into the bioinformatics aspect of things. So you've been a co-PI for the ENB program. And I know I'm one of the you know fellows from the MSc uh, ENBIT uh, program. Can you speak to us about so probably for those that don't know about some of the successes that you have experienced uh, from running uh, the program? Well, of course, Ruth, the first and the biggest success is you guys 
you are one classic example of a success story for this ENB supported program. Having uh, uh, world class graduates who end up getting absorbed straight away for PhDs or for job opportunities like research assistants and so forth straight even before you graduate. Some of some of you even secure these positions even before you defend your thesis. That's a huge mm. success for us, you know. And then one other success which I really is so profound is this that you guys the way you established the bhk the informatics hub of kenya that initiative yes. which came about from the first cohort yes. that is also a big success story for for enbit because it was student-led it was self-motivated from the students and i think the biggest biggest success the the thing the the, the milestone that really uh, mm -hmm. pegs enbit as a success i think is us securing this dad funding to host yeah. the in-country, in-region, because mm -hmm. DAD usually tries to strengthen and foster and support regional networking with partner institutions and partner universities with the aim of yeah. building capacity, strengthening education and research in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, ENBIT showed and demonstrated that, yes, you can have a regional network and you can mm -hmm. have students, regional students crisscrossing. We had Ugandans, Tanzanians, Kenyans studying yeah. in Pwani, and we had vice versa in Makerere and so forth. So I think yeah. that is a resounding success for Ian Bitt, and I'm so happy, and I'm happy to be part of it, and happy yeah. that I could use that success to secure the DAD funding. That is so, you know, so happy. I mean, if I think about it, yeah, that's actually one of the, you know, highest achievements that you guys can, you know, uh, carry on and I know even after the DAD fellowship we'll probably get another funding you know as a continuation of foundation from ENBIT so yeah thank you so much for sharing that and uh, before I continue um, for those that are joining us uh, we have uh, Professor Suheila Hashim uh, speaking to us about you know she's already spoken to us about her experience how she got to become associate professor but now we are speaking about the bioinformatics program so if you have questions for her please uh, be ready to start sharing them on the chat so that we can uh, save on time and also let us know where you're joining us from if you're in kenya uganda tanzania we would want to know the statistics so we know how far we are you know getting in terms of outreach and also, um, yeah, feel free to engage on us on our social media platforms as well. Yeah, so, okay, let's proceed, uh, Prof. So, you know, we've talked about uh, the ENBIT program, but most people will probably want to understand about the, the curriculum, you know, at Puan University. So maybe can you speak to us about the curriculum uh, in terms of its co key components and objectives and things that, you know, uh, are relevant for the, for the program? Mm, okay, yeah, so I'll just summarize the curriculum. So yeah. it's typically a two year program. Uh, the first year is the coursework and then the second year is the research component. Now in the coursework, we have 10 taught courses, taught over two semesters. So semester one, five courses, then semester two, uh, the other five courses. So the first semester is introductory. We take students through introductory, introductory courses in programming and uh, molecular biology and uh, basics of genomics, comparative genomics, sequence analysis, HP computing. And then in semester two, we build up on those. And uh, we now focus in and narrow down to programming for bioinformaticians and take them through structural bioinformatics, proteomics. You know, now it's all about multiomics, phylogenetics, yeah. population genetics, GWAS, and so forth. Then when they're done with their coursework, this is now the game changer for the MSc Bioinformatics program, which is from ENBIT. We yes. have this five week residential training, which you all did. And uh, this one now hones in on strengthening the skills gap of you know, improving and building the bioinformatics technical capacity for the student to equip them, to prepare them for the for their research component. Because it's one thing to be in class and learn about tools, Python, whatever, JavaScript, whatever, mm, whatever. Mm, it's mm. another thing to use it to develop a pipeline to do yes. some comparative genomics or population genetics and so forth. So then yeah. this is a hands-on practical five-week, very intensive uh, residential training, which is done still at ECP with ENBIT. If you remember, uh, Dan Masiga was the, co the PI uh, of ENBIT. So the residential training was done there. 
Now then Matiga managed to secure a, a different program. Uh, it's called Eneza Data Science. It's still yeah. funded with the NIH. Yeah. And he has still retained that component. So again, mm. the DD funded students and they, even the self-sponsored, at this point, anybody who's registered for MSc Bioinformatics at Spwani, mm. whether you're self-sponsored or your DAD or ENBIT, whatever, you're mm. all taken through this. So the first cohort of the DAD uh, students, they went for yeah. their residential training. And I think they, they, when Parcelli talks, she will tell you how fulfilling yeah. that was. Because they're taken through the first part, they're taught all the practical skills, and then they're a mini project, so they learn collaborative research, uh, group projects, and so forth, to just enhance, enhance their skills. And then now comes the research phase. Now, this is also another game changer. Unlike any MSc programs, this one, we strive our best to place students in international research institutions, even national ones, uh, to yeah. work so that students get to work with um, donor-funded research projects with internationally recognized scientists. So therefore, this provides a foolproof opportunity for all our students to publish in high-impact peer-reviewed journals, including yourself, Ruth. You also came yeah. up with a good publication. So yeah. students have this opportunity to work on the cutting edge of their research field. And yeah. initially, it was Ian-Bit Partners. So Ian-Bit Partners would be, of course, Pwani, Makerere, and uh, uh, Muhimbili as the universities. Yeah. And then we had the uh, Uganda Virus Research Institute, ILRI, ISIPE, and Kemri Welcome Trust Research Program. Yeah. Now, we have actually gone beyond. And this is the beauty also. This is another success uh, bit of Ian-Bit, where the network has now expanded to beyond just the East African region. Mm, now we yes. have also partners from Europe. We have the Center for Genomics Research in Spain, which hosted wow. two students in the last cohort, University of Milano in Italy, Orebro wow. University wow. in Sweden, University of Tennessee. So we are getting new and new uh, partners on board, you know, which is really, really yeah. nice. And in fact, uh, the a current cohort we joined in September, there's another new consortium, EU funded, mm -hmm. where there's Tanzania, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and um, I don't know, so many other countries, including some Francophone countries, Benin, Burkina Faso. They approached us and they sent, they wanted to send us four students to do oh, wow. MSc, but to sub, yes. So unfortunately, the student from DRC could not come. But now, in addition to Ugandans and Tanzanians, we have people yeah. from Benin, Burkina Faso, Malawi, and now wow. also one from DRC. So it's amazing the that cohort? yes, the current cohort. Wow, wow. Yes, we have now Francophone students in this, thanks to DAD and thanks to this, mm -hmm. uh, the success of this program. But all this is due to the EN bit factor, yeah. you know. So as yeah. a result of this research component, we produce internationally competitive young bioinformaticians route for you to land a fellowship, a PhD fellowship at Oxford University. That speaks a lot, right? It shows yes. the quality of, of the of the of the graduates. Yeah. Of course, of course. And I am always proud to share this. I don't know if you want to come and debate with me, we can debate. But this <laughs> bioinformatics program is the best. In the world, I have met different people that have done different bioinformatics courses from different places. And I can assure you or attest that this one, there's not, <laughs> okay, none of it comes close to what we have at Puani. So I don't think you need any more convincing. So if you're thinking of doing a bioinformatics master's, you know where to apply or you know where, <laughs> you know where, <laughs> what to do. Um, we've done our best to actually bring Prof on board and even Parcelli and even some of us that have gone before to share our experiences. Uh, so yeah, don't wait for any more convincing. <laughs> do your bit as well. All right. Um, so we are going to proceed and i think prof it's important for you for you know the way you highlighted uh the residential training because i personally can attest about you know the the influence that it had before i started my research because when you're doing coursework and then you're doing all the learning you need a phase or a challenging phase that you know you can get to incorporate the skills that you've learned and also you also learn how to collaborate with others because 
you're being paired into groups to work on projects, which means that you're, you're learning also how to work with others and also learning how to implement the skills that you've been trained to do. In as much as we try to do, if you like, you know, practical ex exercises during the coursework, but I feel like the residential training sort of cements that. So that's a very important component. And most programs don't have that. OK, mm -hmm. most programs either have the coursework and then a small research phase or just the coursework only and that's it. But this program is different because it has that key component. So I just wanted to emphasize that so that when you're applying, you know why you are applying to this uh, uh, program. All right, Prof. Um, so I think a, a few people are asking about the requirements in terms of like, um, for you to qualify for the dad fellowship. So we can speak about that uh, a bit and then uh, see how to proceed from there. Yes, yes. So, okay, funny entry requirements, the academic at least requirement is that you must have a BSc in uh, biological sciences. It could be BSc biochem, BSc biotech, BSc molecular biology and biotechnology, microbiology, botany, zoology, any bioscience basically. But as long as the bioscience you've done has a strong background or at least you've done several courses in biochemistry and molecular biology that's really important and if you've done bioinformatics also in your undergraduate that will also be good uh, or a bsc in computer science that's for the pony academic requirement now dad uh, from their advert and i'm reading vomit verbatim here i'm just highlighting from their advert to how what they've said is that number one you must be a graduate of, with a first academic degree and the minimum is a second class upper division, no less. If you have a second lower, you don't qualify. You know, Ruth, um, for master's programs, uh, yeah. first class or second upper is a direct entry. If yeah. you have a second lower, you must work for two years in a relevant setting, and then you can yeah. come and do your master's. With a pass, that's the end of the road for you, for in the academia at least. Now, yeah. for a scholarship, that's where the difference is. Yeah. For the DAD scholarship, if you do not have a second upper, don't bother to apply. You'll just not be shortlisted. Mm. Yeah, mm. so that's very important for for applicants to know. Don't waste your time if you don't have a lower. If you if you don't have an upper, if you have a lower and you've done two years of work in a research field, you've done some bioinformatics. We have taken students with lower who have two years of the relevant experience, and they've they've been quite good because they, these are people who really narrowed down and spent the two years learning bioinformatics and now they want to do the master's so but yeah. so that they're closed out for for this and then yeah. they want a clear motivation strong commitment and you should have thorough knowledge of the language of instruction so if for example like for us we had to take we, we are now taking people from francophone countries they have to show proof of uh, proficiency in english you know, mm -hmm. for us who study in Kenya and the medium of instruction is English, then we have no problem. So that's yep. what they require. And this is another thing, your university, the last university degree should not be more than six years ago. Yep. So we normally rule them out and even DAD rules them out. We don't mm -hmm. want somebody who stayed six years and beyond to now come back and try to do masters. And then you must be nationals or permanent residents of a sub-Saharan country. And okay. they prefer if you're a member of staff or a candidate uh, who is going to be, uh, what they want is that they want to build capacity so that you can be absorbed back to the into institution. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's important for that you've highlighted about the sub-Saharan Africa because I think there's a, uh, someone from Nigeria that, has, that uh, was asking about the acceptance rate for international students. Um, mm. And uh, I think, Prof, you've covered that, that you're taking students from all over sub-Saharan Africa. It's not just tied to uh, the East African region. So I hope that answers your question. And um, if I can add, Ruth, also, yeah. Uh, yeah. the agreement we have with the DAD, we only get two in-country scholarships. So the scholarships for Kenyans are only two. But okay. for mm -hmm. the in-region, they are five. Wow, okay. And sometimes so, we struggle mm -hmm. to, to, to fill the five slots because we don't get strong candidates. But for okay. Kenya, of course, and East Africa, we always get very good candidates, especially okay. Kenyan candidates. They're usually quite uh, strong, maybe this is the language or whatever. But yeah. this is just something to emphasize that for the regional students, Nigeria and the rest of Africa, yeah. you stand a very big chance. For Kenyans, right. it's much highly competitive. Okay. Yeah. All right, there you go, guys. You've heard it from Prof. So if you're an international student, you know, 
go for it, go for it. And even if you're like Kenyan, don't give up because they're just two slots. Uh, you could be the part of the two slots. So don't give up on yourself, you know, uh, shoot your shot. And yeah, you probably end up as one of the two people that will be selected. Okay, yes, so, and sometimes yeah. uh, they also, in special circumstances, they might consider those who are on the reserve and they're given the slots as well. So okay. like the first cohort with Parcelli, we ended up getting more than two. So okay. by all means, yeah. Apply, yeah. yeah. Or somebody and among the two, yeah. they might uh, decline the offer and then it can go to you who's on the reserve or on the next on the list, you know. Mm, so don't be sense, de yeah. de dejected or discouraged. Please apply. Because yes, for some reason or the other, people sometimes turn down the DAD scholarship. We've had that experience in both cohorts. We've, we are now yeah. on the third cohort, yes. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, o okay. Um, now I read, <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say because I was reading what was on the chat. But yeah, um, I think Prof, you can also speak about, now that you are speaking about selection and being competitive, and um, what what do you think would make a candidate stand out in terms of qualities or experiences that you know the application team expects? Mm. Well, definitely the motivation, eh? it has to be very convincing. Mm -hmm. You have to write a very compelling motivation. Why bioinformatics? Why not biochem or immunology or plant sciences? Is it just you're after the scholarship because you just want somebody to pay for you and you just study? We want to really know why is it that you want to do bioinformatics? And you have to also mm -hmm. come up with a comprehensive, convincing, realistic concept note. That's also mm -hmm. a requirement that DAD requires you to write a short concept of your proposed. You might not do that project, but we want to see whether your thought process, are you thinking like a scientist? Yeah. Are you yeah. proposing something doable? You know, And then also you should come across as somebody self-motivated, somebody who is who's knowledgeable and who knows what bioinformatics really is all about. Because sometimes you will see that from an interview that somebody really has no idea what is bioinformatics. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So somebody well articulated, somebody who's really focused and self-motivated, really, you, you have to really convince us why do you want to do bioinformatics, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So don't just submit a blind application. Make sure that whatever application you're submitting is very competitive. And even when you get a chance to go to the interview, that you're actually ready or prepared for the interview and don't just show up blindly because this is very competitive as you've had they only take seven uh students across sub-saharan africa so you want to be part of those make sure you submit a competitive application all right so uh prof there's a question about whether if you've done a class a clinical um degree undergraduate degree that is not classified in the categories of first class 2.1 uh, but you have extra training in uh, bioinformatics like introduction to bioinformatics are you considered for the program Yes, we have taken uh, in the past uh, people who have uh, BSc in biomedical sciences and uh, who have done additional courses in, in, in bioinformatics or they've done an internship at ECP, for example, in bioinformatics. And if they're compelling enough, we do consider those, yes. All right, all right, that makes sense. So, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Enuria, it's only candidates from sub Saharan Africa that are in, um, qualify for this particular scholarship so yeah i think that answers your question and then stacy is asking about the application process but i think that one you can get it from the website right about how to apply yes but and i'll share you with you our flyer mm. okay well you have to go to the dad and submit your application through their portal and at the same yeah. time you have to apply for the program at point university so we have a flyer which gives you the links to both and we've put our yeah. contact uh, emails in case you're facing a challenge and money mm -hmm. we normally charge an application processing fee mm -hmm. of three thousand for kenyans and and east africans and four thousand kenya shillings for the non-east africans however yeah if you're applying for the dad scholarship then we waive that fee for the, at the time of application and then we'll only ask you to pay it once you're successful, because it's only fair. You cannot ask 300 people yeah. to pay for 3,000 shillings and you're going yeah. to take only two, you know? Yeah. So we are, we are, the management, university management is, was uh, uh, whatever, you know, magnanimous enough to say, okay, it, it would not be fair to ask everybody to pay this fee. So yeah. 
we just we, we've written it very clearly there that the processing fee you don't have to pay it at the time of applying you'll only yeah. pay if you are uh, you secure the a slot and that means we yeah. do not issue we i always get this question so i might as well yeah. delete it right now the you know the deadline is 21st november so students yeah. rush to apply to Pwani expecting that before 21st november we'll give them a, an admission letter again yeah. we cannot issue admission letters to 300 people right yeah so we receive your application. DAD just wants to know that you've applied. And then we wait and, and for the selection process to take its course. And then at some point in the selection process, we cross-check. You've applied for DAD scholarship? Yes. Have you applied for Pwani? Yes. No. That's part of the selection. You see? So then at that point is when now we consider. And then after that, then once the, the selection process is over, of course, there's a short listing and then there's interviews. And then if you're successful for the interview, then you're offered. Once DAD offers you the scholarship, then we process your admission letter. So that's right. how the procedure goes. Yeah. So please don't ask, email me asking for admission letters. We cannot give you admission letters at this point. But DAD will just want proof that you've applied to Pwani as well. All yeah. right. I hope that mm -hmm. clarifies it. And I think it's important that <laughs> Stacy asked about it uh, because I also don't think I knew about all the, the details that you've shared. So that's Stacey, good. I did, hope it clarifies. Is it Stacy who emailed me, I believe? I don't know if it's the same Stacy. Maybe there are many other Stacys, but it's fine. Yeah, it could be the same or a different one. But yeah. Um, mm. So, Prof, just to get you clear so if you're applying for the DAD fellowship, you don't pay. For the application. You don't pay for the application fee or processing okay. fee at one yet, but the ones who successfully get the admission letter, at the time of the admission, we'll ask them to kindly pay that processing fee. Okay. Yeah? okay. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, it's 3,000 Kenyan shillings. So in, in, yes. in case you are not familiar with the Kenyan currency, yeah. for mm -hmm. East Africans. And for non-East Africans, it's 4,000. 4,000 Kenyan shillings. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll share the flyer with you and you can share it with the network. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, and then someone else is asking whether the payment, the the e-citizen payment is not going through. What are other payment options that uh, you can make? Unfortunately, we are bound by that now. We've all okay. migrated. Yeah, even buying a cup of tea at Pwani, you have to pay through e-citizen. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. So unfortunately, I'm sorry. If the e-citizen portal doesn't work, yeah. there is an email of the admissions officer, Mr. Said Mini. Yeah. You can just contact him and find out what you can do. But again, if you're applying for the DAD scholarship, you don't have to pay this. So you yeah. can even pay when you report to Pwani. You know, we know you're going to run away. So yeah. <laughs> you've been with us for two years. So you will, yeah. when you're there, then we'll sort it out, you know. Okay. Because even for the international students, it's very hard to pay via e-citizen. That's why we decided, let's yeah. shelve it aside. We'll sort it out when they come, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think I understand Stacey's question, whether do we have to send the application via mail to the university, but I'm guessing she's asking about applying for the program. Yeah, yeah. And I think, hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. Application, ahead, you, you can receive, yeah, we receive the soft, soft copies, we receive hard copies, you can email your application to admissions at PU or just contact Mr. Said Mini, he'll guide you how to apply. Because, of course, international students, we don't expect them to mail hard copies of everything. Yeah, you know? yeah, if yeah. COVID taught us nothing else, at least we went digital in many of our processes, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you. We are 44 people strong right now. So if you still have questions for Prof. Oh, Collins, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you, Prof. I, I, I was just curious. I don't know if this was already mentioned, but I was curious if there are any um, open or e-distance or e-learning options um, uh, for the course, not necessarily for the DAD scholarship, but at Pwani. Is there any, any such... Um, flexible study options at the moment or in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, when during COVID times, we were all compelled to go uh, distance e-learning, and that was because of COVID. And bioinformatics was one of the first programs to switch to e-learning because it's bioinformatics. You can learn it uh, virtually. However, uh, at the moment now, we've moved back to physical uh, uh, learning so one has to be physical in Kenya uh, we don't have yet mechanisms to have 
it, it's a bit cra uh, uh, hectic to have the same program running in two different uh, modes, uh, the face-to-face -face and the e-learning. So we are thinking as a university to shift, especially the uh, postgraduate programs to try and offer the, the 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 distance learning mode. So that is works in progress for the whole universe, not just bioinformatics. I hope that answers you, Colin. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So we are wrapping up with Prof. So in case anyone has a, any burning question, type it very quickly because we are wrapping up. And uh, Prof, uh, you know, we've spoken a lot about the scholarship and the program. But can you also mention about the kind of support that the DAD fellowship offers aside just the stipend, the monthly stipend? Um, is there any other sort of formal sub, uh, support that people get from the DAD fellowship? Yeah, well, the scholarship covers the tuition fee, the monthly yeah. stipend, and then they have what they call an annual study allowance and annual research allowance. Okay. A thesis publication cost, so to print your final thesis, they'll give you money to do that. And then for the again the in region they get a travel insurance a travel okay. allowance and a health insurance for the in okay. region also the in country yeah right. and then uh, Parcel will allow her to talk about the the opportunities as a, a yes. DAD uh, scholar because she went for a summer camp in Germany and you can also do your research work uh, there but most importantly once you're a DAD alumni there are a lot yeah. of funding opportunities amazing all right mm -hmm. go ahead. Go Kutlo, uh, sorry if I'm from, you know, butchering your name. <laughs> Go ahead, your hand is raised up. Oh, probably you have the same question. Is a DAD scholarship given every year? It, well, they will, if you get the scholarship, it will be for 24 months. Yeah. And for now, we had uh, won this, uh, what you'd call a grant or a, a cycle. It's a three year cycle. So we are on our third. Uh, cohort uh, the last this 2025 call is the last one and now we are applying now to host again for the next three year cycle but it's highly competitive we don't know as fun if we will be successful or not so this is the final DAD cohort as we know yeah all right so better shoot your shots <laughs> while you still can uh so i don't know who mark is but can you go ahead your hand is raised up Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe, and my question is: uh, When you have uh, managed to secure the DAAD scholarship, and you want to do your publication, maybe do your research, and you want to publish it, will the uh, the university or the department and the DAAD scholarship allow you to publish it under your name as your as a first author? Or they have to give the precedence to the to the prof and the department first. I will let Ruth answer that because she has published under this program. Ruth, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they allow you to be first author. So it's not yeah, the 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 your supervisor counts as, you know, the last um the the final author. So yeah, you you still make first author. Right. Uh Kutlo, go ahead. Kutlo, can you, okay, probably not pronouncing your name correctly, but you have your hand raised up. All right, while we're waiting for that, um, Azima is asking, to apply now, will I have to make the application to Pony and Pay application? I think we've talked about this already, so maybe, yeah. You can listen to the recording later on. But basically, um, what Prof has said, if you're applying for the DAD fellowship, you don't need to pay the fee right now. You pay when you are selected. So I hope that clarifies it. Uh, and then Prof, uh, let's move a bit from the application bit and speak about what you find most rewarding about your work at Pwani uh, and in the field of bioinformatics. Uh, you've been in this space for, for a while now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, what is rewarding is uh, when we see students like you, Ruth, succeeding. You know, you are a Pwani alumni from the word go, you know, and then when we see you prospering and, you know, flying out uh, of the nest and uh, uh, succeeding so well, that is 
really our reward when we see you guys graduating and doing so well. That is the really the most rewarding, uh, what, what I find rewarding about Pwani. Yeah. All right, and, uh, thanks. Yes, yes, absolutely. That is for us. For It's like a parent, you know, when they see their child prospering yeah. and doing so well, that is the yeah. reward we, we are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I think Hadija had asked about the requirements. We've already spoken about that as well. Um, but basically, yeah, you can listen to the recording later on so we save on time. Um, and Prof, in your opinion, what do you think are the most significant trends and future direction that um, students should be aware of in the field of bioinformatics? Hmm. Well, um... Right now, the buzzword is machine learning, AI, mm -hmm. multi-omics, you know. The only caution is that bioinformatics is such a fast developing field, you know. So if yeah. you have to really, really, really keep up, you know, with, yeah. the, with, with the latest development. So one has to be really, I'm sure even for you, Ruth, the, the, the t tools you used uh, for your masters and now what you're yeah. using for your, they, they are probably updated and upgraded by, 10 times over or something. So that is one area that is really like developing so much. But AI, machine learning right now, that's really the, uh, and then and big data, that is all uh, the, the future. That's where we are headed, yeah. you know. So if you if you don't do bioinformatics, at least do data science, you know, you'll be at least also close enough there because that is where we, we are headed. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Prof. And I think Kutlo uh, typed his, their question on the chat um so yeah uh, like prof mentioned this is the last year they are running the dad fellowship uh, and if they get funding to run it for another three years then they will do it but they are not sure of that so yeah if you want to apply for the dad fellowship then apply now and then for the research topics uh, i think prof you can speak about that aspect do you give students masters uh projects or do they can they come up with their uh, research projects? Yeah, it's a bit of both, but uh, one unique feature, like I said, with the research component, we try to attach students to already funded projects because that way you get to work with internationally recognized scientists and the funding, usually the second year funding for research is always the tricky bit. So if you get hosted mm -hmm. by a group or a scientist or a PI who already has a project and it has funding, you're a lot yeah. much better off than you trying yeah. to now come up with your own. But we are open yeah. to, to, yeah. to to further uh, discussions and the avenues. And But it's a lot easier to just latch on because that way you get to work with internationally recognized scientists and you get to publish your work as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And before I let you go, go Prof, I just want to highlight that, you know, if you don't get the DAD fellowship, it doesn't mean that you should not do the uh, MSc Bioinformatics. If you can find yourself or if you can find, find a different funder uh, so that you become a self-sponsored student, you can still do this program because like I mentioned or like I've overemphasized that it's one of the best in the world. So you might want to still do it even if you don't get the uh, fellowship. And also because, you know, you get the added advantage of doing the residential training course that we've talked about. And also potentially you can be matched to a, a, a project uh, during your second year. So that is still a win for you. So if you get the DAD fellowship, well and good, go for it. If you don't get it, that's not the end of the world. You can still do the bioinformatics program uh, in Pwani. So to just sum it up, uh, Prof, uh, when will Pwani start offering PhD in bioinformatics? Okay, that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I like who, who asked that question. <laughs> that's Nehemiah. Nehemiah is very forward thinking, yes. Uh, I think that is the <laughs> next logical step for Pwani. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Nehemiah. Definitely, that is the way, the route we should go. Uh, although we have to be aware of... Uh, the processes it takes to start up a program, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. CUE requirements and all that, yeah? Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, Pro, final remarks so that we can allow Paseli to share her experience. Yes, as yes, well, yes, yeah. yes. No, I, I just want to say that uh, I want to appreciate this opportunity. It's the first time I've ever been invited to a webinar to talk about this really wonderful program. So I really appreciate uh, this uh, opportunity. And again, to 
re-echo what I keep telling you, Ruth. You are amazing. You're doing an amazing job with the team. We are so proud of you, and we're proud of all our alumni. Thank you so much. And to the rest, I, yeah. And to the rest, I just want to tell you, whatever it is you do or decide to do, or whatever life throws in your hand, hand or in your way, grab it with your two hands and make the most of it. You just never know where it will lead you. Okay. Do Absolutely. your best at all times. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prof. And I can attest to that. I did both my undergraduate and my master's in Pwani, and that was one of the best decisions that I've made, ever made in my life uh, because I got to meet incredible people like Prof. Suhela, who got to mentor me. So, yeah, take whatever she's saying <laughs> seriously because, yeah, she's, she's good. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, now we'll have Paseli. Uh, Pasteli, I don't know whether you can share your video um, so that you can speak to us about your experiences. Oh, there you go. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so Pasteli is going to speak to us about her experiences as one of the um, DAD fellows. I think you are in the, is it the first or second cohort, Pasteli? Is it the first? First, yeah, first yeah. cohort. All right, that's that's great. And I think we've answered the we've talked about you know the requirements on and uh, how you get to do the MS in bioinformatics. So I want to uh, ask you to speak about you know uh, that and your background. So maybe we can just jump into you know um, what did you find more exciting in terms of the topics that uh, was offered at Pwani? Which ones did you find more particularly engaging or beneficial for you? Uh, thanks, Ruth, for having me today uh, for the program in bioinformatics at Pony University. So one of the most interesting units for me was programming. Yeah, because I was really fascinated with uh, using computers, uh, writing some lines of codes and uh, actually getting the output. So I'd say that has been really beneficial to me together with genomics and sequencing because currently I'm working on a project on genomic epidemiology and the much that I got from class is what I'm actually relying on for my project here. Yeah. Great, great. And and how do you think, you know, this program generally, the, the coursework, the residential training, and maybe you can also speak to us about what uh, Prof mentioned, the summer camp that you did, and all other opportunities that the fellowship has provided for you. So speak to us about that, the opportunities that you got, and how do you think that has prepared you for your future career? Uh, so through the DAD scholarship at Pony University, uh, first of all, the masters in bioinformatics are uh, really for the first year you have like uh, coursework, and the courses that we get through this first year really lays a good foundation in terms of bioinformatics and what you get to do in your second year. So for the first year, you actually taught like ten units, and all whatever you're taught in the first uh, first year is is what you build on uh, during your project phase. So I, I would say that the program actually lays some good foundation in bioinformatics, really good foundation that whatever now you experience, regardless of which project you get, you, you, you know you're good and you know you're going to survive through it. Yeah. And then also through the DAD scholarship, um, you get a chance to apply for a summer school. And I, I got to one and attended a summer school in August. So there are four summer schools, uh, depending on your interest. Mine was uh, more associated with education and research, specifically for health sciences. So I was there for one month and we did some uh, course on statistics, epidemiology, a lot of training on scientific communication, more like just exposing you to the international space and what people are doing out there. And yeah. again, you also gain from that. It's not all about coursework. We also got to tour Germany. We went to Berlin and uh, it was really an exciting uh, opportunity for me here. Yeah. All right. And, and you know, other aspects of the program aside the summer school and the coursework and the research phase, that you found exciting? So we also have the residential training that our prof had mentioned. 
which is a five-week training. We got to go to Isipe. And what I liked about the training, it was uh, hands-on. So you really get to practice uh, the skills you learned in class. You get a project you're supposed to work on. And for this case, it was quite different from uh, the previous cohort because this was mm -hmm. more on data science and we were exposed yeah. to a lot of machine learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think right. apart from that, I think also the program from Pony, you get access to these big research institutions like Camry, Isipe, Ildri. And remember, those are your potential employers. So mm -hmm. at least Pony by itself acts as a key and it opens doors to like great opportunities that by yourself you didn't have gotten into these programs. Yeah. I like that. I like that aspect. So it gets you to the door and then once you get to the door, you know, you can yeah. maneuver your mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you for sharing that. So yeah, and I, I think there's the last uh, part of the question that I asked about your future career. How do you think that, you know, this program has laid a foundation for that? So for me, um, so I'm interested in bioinformatics and I feel bioinformatics like it's home for me. And this is yeah. something that uh, um, I get a lot of fulfillment doing. So even yeah. before applying for the program, I was at yeah. point A and my point B is a point whereby I'm proficient in bioinformatics and I'm able to work in the industry. Yeah. And but Ruth, if you also allow me to just mention, we also have a, a small organization which is called yeah. Mobile Informatics, which really requires, uh, provides opportunity for bioinformaticians. Yeah. So through the program, I have gotten the skills and I'm still through the process learning. And yeah. hopefully I get to now be a fully fledged bioinformatician. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, I wanted you to speak about that aspect because I think it's very exciting. And like had as Prof mm -hmm. mentioned that, you know, most of the students go out, go on to do incredible things. And Paseli is one of the co-founders of Genome, Bi Genome Bioinformatics, mm -hmm. which sort of like provides bioinformatics services uh, to people. And Paseli was also, fun fact, was also my student at some point. <laughs> so I'm also uh, proud of her to see how far she's going with uh, her career. And, all right, so going back to sharing your experiences, Paseli, as a DAD fellowship, you know, uh, you've gone through the process and you know how it feels to apply for the program. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us what, you know, you think helped you prepare for the application um, and, you know, what elements particularly, what like what you think were essential in making you a successful candidate? Uh, okay, so applying for the DD scholarship what really helped me number one is to plan quite well because you have a deadline and there are a number of documents that you need prepared so i would say the first thing is to have a checklist on what is required whether you need a motivation letter a cv a proposal your transcript once you have your checklist, then you can start working through them one by one to ensure that you have all the documents. But I think yeah. among the first things that you need to work on is the proposal and also the concept. And regarding the proposal, uh, you really need, as Prof said, uh, your motivation is what sells you. And people can really tell whether you're motivated to do it or you're just doing it for the sake from your motivation itself. So mm -hmm. some of the things to consider from your motivation is why why do you want to do bioinformatics? Why do why do you want to do a master's? Why now? Why Pani University? There are many other universities in Kenya you'd have, you'd have applied for, but why Pani University? And then also I think what the other important thing is what are your goals? in the program and post like after the program once you are able to capture all that it's clear that i'm not just doing this for the sake but i'm mm -hmm. doing this program because right now i'm at this point point a and i want to go to point b make sure you have it like it's a bridge to something else you're just not doing it for the sake and then the other thing that also helped me is sharing my motivation letter and also the proposal with my mentors. I think I shared mine with Ruth to just go through it. Because when you have other people reading your work, they can easily point out some areas. They can also tell you whether they feel you're motivated or not. 
and also the other thing apart from sharing it with your mentors and also friends to just review it uh, prior to the interview make sure like you also do a mock interview to just ensure that you're saying the right things you're capturing what you need to capture yeah but the the greatest thing is to also do your research because mm -hmm. you can't just say at Pony University is the best university like <laughs> you, you need to have some some evidence to it exactly yes. yeah yes. so I think that Absolutely. that is what really helped me out yeah exactly yeah thank you thank thank you personally for sharing that yeah so just not be, you know because I'm saying Pwani is the best university mm -hmm. and then you're going down to you have to come and you know defend your point as to why Pwani is yeah. uh, the best for this program so yeah that's a valid point to bring up so personally while you were applying did you encounter any challenging aspects during the application process that you think is important to highlight so that others that are trying to apply right now would you know or overcome them or if there are no challenges as well it's okay to say you know there there were no challenges with the application process i think um my challenge was first of all just uh getting to navigate the dad portal so what yeah. helped me is to just reach out to people even online there are many online resources that you can easily get on how to navigate and also how to fill the form that is there and also the other thing was to developing a, a concept or a proposal again you just reach out to your mentors and they can help you with that yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right that sounds good so looking back now that you're a dad you know uh fella or alumni <laughs> okay not yet alumni but now that you're a dad fella would you recommend the scholarship to others and what key benefits would you be highlighting when you are recommending it oh i've answered your first question for you <laughs> i would say i would say I would recommend uh, anyone to apply to for the DAD scholarship, a thousand percent, yes. A reason being DAD cares for you as a beneficiary of the scholarship all the way from the steep end. Uh, you don't really need to, to worry about your finances. They have that covered. So all you need to do is to focus on your education. The other thing is uh, DAD by itself exposes you to a lot of uh, other opportunities like attending the summer school you also have an opportunity to do a research training uh, your research project in Germany for six months we also have additional trainings that are not part of the that are not part of the program that you're doing we also have collaboration and also uh, once you're done with your program you you remaining as a DAD alumni and there are also other funding opportunities for that yeah so yeah. I would really recommend for people to apply for DAD because it really cares take it takes care of all your needs yeah absolutely absolutely all right yeah um so if you are unaware Paseli is one of the DAD fellas uh from the first cohort if you have questions uh specifically for her about her experience uh you can uh, you know raise your hand so I can ask you to unmute or you can just type it in the chat as we are sort of like summarizing this session. So if you still have like burning question for us, uh, please share it now. And I think speaking about question, there's a question for you, uh, Pasili from Kate, who's asking um, regarding the genomic epidemiology project, uh, I'm interested in doing something related to that. Okay, my question is how can one identify trends from the data because most of this database, okay, I don't know whether this is a technical question that we should take here or uh, whether you are able to answer it now, Pasili. Uh, it's a technical question. Okay, yeah, so Kate, yeah. please reach out to Pasili. Um, Pasili, please uh, share your uh, social handles so she can reach out later and then you can have a conversation uh, on that uh, later on. All right. Um, so, Paseli, the other question that I have for you is that, you know, I've been preaching that, you know, the MSc Bioinformatics program is one of the best. But what motivated you particularly, <laughs> now this seems like an interview, to apply for, for the MSc in, in Pwani University? You know, what, what was your motivation? Uh, and, you know, you could have applied to, you know, UN or any other institution in sub-Saharan Africa, Africa generally. Uh, so why did you apply uh, for the program in Pwani? At the top of my list is the track record. 
I, I got an opportunity to interact with uh, alumni from uh, Pony University that included Ruth, Eric, and others. And I've seen what the quality of the students they produce and, and how far their students go. And I really wanted to be in that space and also to be like them. And that's why I applied for Pony, number one. The mm -hmm. other reason was getting to Pony by itself, you, you already gain access to these other partner institutions, like now I'm at Cambry, and that's also through Pony. The other one is also the availability of the funding, because you also want to go to a place where you won't struggle with finances, you know, just focus on your education. Yeah, yeah. I think those are my like top three reasons why I really applied to Pony. And yeah. also the, the 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 coursework also just going through it and just realizing they have a residential training. Mm -hmm. the, the truth is that they ensure that you you really come out of this program when you're really good in you are in a good bioinformatician. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I hope you know everyone has uh, noted that. And Paselli, you know, uh, for those that are considering applying for this i know we've spoken about your you know the top three points why they should apply but is there anything any other thing you'd like to add in terms of advice uh, for prospective students what i'd say is um just the first thing is to search yourself and really ask yourself why do you want this once you have that it's quite easier to navigate the other things and mm -hmm. uh do it scared and the other thing is to as much as we just have two scholarships for, sorry, power has just gone off this side, but <laughs> the other, so yeah, you okay. might, the other thing is to believe that you're going to get this scholarship as much as we just have two opportunities for Kenyan, but just believing in yourself that you're capable of doing this and you, yeah. you'll get it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paseli. Uh, Mark? I don't know why why this person is calling themselves Mark, but I think he's the guy from Zimbabwe. Um, so asking about what were your programming skills like uh, before you started your MEC? So for me, I would say I was above beginner level because I'd attended an um, internship, by informatics internship at ECP. So I had some prior experience yeah, with programming. Yeah, but I would say even if you're a beginner, the program still is still fit for beginners. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can give my own sort of like experience and say that when I started the MSc Bioinformatics in Pwani, I didn't have any background experience in bioinformatics. And you looking back right now, uh, you know, going through the program and running trainings and, you know, even teaching others, it's possible to do it from a zero point. As long as you're passionate about it or as long as you know what you want to do, it's possible to do it. So if you have some experience, that's a good starting point. But I think what's more important is are you motivated towards doing or building a career in bioinformatics? Do you actually want to pursue this? If your answer is yes, then go for it. Whether you have a, a experience or not, just you know, submit a very competitive motivation. And um, just to sum up, uh, Paseli, um, I think uh, we, I don't see any other questions on the chat or people raising their hands. So I, I'm assuming all their questions have been answered. Um, and to just uh, summarize everything, um, Oh, Johnny has a question. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Ruth and uh, Paseli and also uh, Prof. Just wanted to ask, um, maybe in your perspective, Paseli, now that you're um, you're there, what do you think is the most important skill to have um, in order for someone to become a proficient by informatician or a successful one? I would say at the top of my list is programming. You 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 need to really get to know your programming well whether it's r python yeah all right uh i hope that answers your questions and remember that in case you have any questions regarding this you can always reach out to Paseli um uh, and uh prof as well but i don't want you to bombard prof at least she, she said shared um 
you know what what is expected so don't go asking questions that have already been answered but if you want to you know understand something that hasn't been mentioned then feel free to reach out to uh Paseli. she's shared her email on the on the chat um abdul abdul razak please go ahead good afternoon everyone Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for the wonderful uh, insights as to how the program is being run. Uh, the other time I asked uh, one question about the acceptance uh, rate, and I was in a very noisy place, so I couldn't uh, add what uh, Prof said with respect to applicants from uh, Nigeria. And secondly, he made mention about the years of a uh, graduation, post-graduation after the undergraduates. So I wanted to know if uh, someone has graduated for more than, if I had her very well, she made mention of seven years uh, timeline or so. So I wanted to know if there is a time limit as to the years of graduation of undergraduates before applying for this uh, postgraduate or, or there is no time limit. Thank you. Prof? Yeah, the second question I got it, uh, time limit, yes, your undergraduate degree should not be more than six years. If it's more than six years, then you're not eligible. The other one was applying from Nigeria. Yeah, by all means, you can apply from Nigeria. Perfect. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. And also, I think the other thing I wanted to highlight about the program is that I think most master's program, they sort of like uh, take a lo longer time than two years. Uh, particularly back in the continent. But this is one of the programs that you're assured that after two years you're out and that after two years you're out and you're ready for the, you know, uh, for the rest of your career. So if you're looking for, you know, doing something also that is within a timeline, this is also something that um, you want to apply for. And uh, just Paseli, I, I cannot see your face anymore, <laughs> but do you want to give like a, uh, you know, final roundup about uh, your your experience and anything that we haven't highlighted that you think is relevant or important for prospective applicants? Uh, thanks, Ruth. So I think we've covered most of it. Just yeah. um for anyone applying for the DAD scholarship, make sure you have your documents right and make sure you put in your best. Yeah, get prepare well for the for the whole process and also the interview. And I wish you all the best. And just lastly, to mention a bit about Genobo Bioinformatics, in case you need any help in terms of your bioinformatics analysis, you can always reach out to us and all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, I know I said initially that final remarks, but in case you want to add something before we close. I, I think uh, I'm good. Uh, just to say again once more, thank you. And I want to wish everyone here all the very best. And please reach out um, if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for joining the session. I hope it has been helpful. And I hope you're going to submit that application for the MSc Bioinformatics, whether with the DAD fellowship or without it. But all the best in your applications. And yeah, I hope to connect in other uh, MSJ sessions as well as in other programs in the uh, bioinformatics uh, space or in the science space. So yeah, thank you, everyone. And see you on the next one. Bye bye.